Hey guys, insight number two, we're in Ether chapter two, verses um, 13 to 15 specifically. But in between where we left off, um, where the brother of Jab was praying and the Lord's like, prepare and you're going to go on this journey, they actually go on this journey. Uh, and they start to prepare then for, in these verses in this chapter, for the journey on the sea. So they get to this really nice beach and, you know, much like Nephi and his time, people spent time on the beach and they were there for a while, it was like, hey, this is pretty good, this will do us, there's, there's food, there's fish out there, there's food back there, and and it's nice, it's a nice spot, this ain't shabby, you know, and I've been on some beaches like that, I'm like, this ain't shabby, this is pretty good, Um, but they did actually travel, if you look in verse 6, it's just interesting, verse 6 and 7, um, that they did travel over different seas and different rivers, maybe not a vast expanse that they were going to have to, but he did give them practice for the journey ahead, and he does that for us too, and I just found that really interesting, um, that I noticed that this time, uh, that yeah, like he gives, he gives us like little mini experiences for the bigger experience, and he's, I could certainly give you so many examples from my life that I would bore you for hours, but um, have a look for that in your life, like whenever you have like these little mini experiences that provide you for this bigger one that's going to come, and if you think about the experiences you're going through now, and you're like, okay, what are these preparing me for, you know, it's really good to look at, um, but 13 through 15, they get comfortable there, and this is Moroni, says, now I proceed with my record, for behold, it came to pass that the Lord did bring Jared and his brethren forth, even to that great sea which divideth the lands, and uh, <clears throat> They pitched their tents, and they called the name of the place Moriankama. And they dwelt in tents, and dwelt in tents upon the seashore for the space of four years. So they were there four years, sunning it up, having a good break, getting strong. And it came to pass at the end of four years that the Lord came again unto the brother of Jared, and stood in a cloud, and talked with him. For the space of three hours did the Lord talk with the brother of Jared, and chastened him, because he remembered not to call upon the name of the Lord. Um, the brother of Jared, of course, repents of what he had done, and, and then they have a really good conversation and, and say, look, you've got to be really wary of this. It makes you ripe for, you know, like sinning and, and um, being cut off from the presence of the Lord. Like it leaves you in a bad position. You, you've got to be better than that. So then he goes on to build barges and he comes up with three problems, which is what we'll talk about next. But I, for one minute, do not think that Ether stopped, or that, sorry, that the brother of Jared stopped praying. I think he continued to pray because that was in his nature. I think it was probably in Jared's nature. His, you know, that both of them as brothers and their, their entire community were probably people of prayer. The difference is that the content of the everyday, you thank you for this, you okay, oh, that was an awesome beach, we're really loving it, cheers, thanks, you know, and, and that's the end of the prayer, rather than calling and crying out, calling on the name of the Lord and crying out for help, and asking, is there more that you would have us do, is there a better place that we need to be, what are we missing from, you know, and my prayers will often, I will often say, you know, Heavenly Father, what am I missing in this picture because it's not working and I can't see what I'm meant to be seeing. My brain's, you know, having brain fog for whatever reason of ill health. I can't see straight on this. So whatever it is, could you literally whack me over the head with it, like make it really obvious so that I can see it because I can't see it right now. And then I'll often say something like that in my prayers. Does it literally hit me on the head? No, but um, he'll make those things quite obvious and quite clear to me, whereas usually I could discern those things, but when you've got brain fog, if you've ever had brain fog, or when you're not well, you don't as well discern those things. You start wondering if it's your brain seeing things or if something, it, it, yeah, so you just need that. So here the Lord chastens the brother of Jared, not necessarily for not praying, Perhaps rather that his prayers were just not calling on Jesus and crying out for those extra things. He was just sort of phoning it in. Um, so we can have a look at how we do that in our life as well and how we could do that better. So it's everyday mundane prayers versus soul-searching, pleading prayers. And what is the difference? What, is, what do you think the difference is? There's the everyday, everyday mundane things that we can say, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's still saying a prayer, but it's not growing relationship. You're not having the conversation with your Father in heaven um, and and pleading for Christ to come help and whatever it might be or to just be with me today, Christ, because, you know, like, you know, I'm sure there was children born in that time that, you know, there was things that they could have cried out for. Maybe some people got sick. I, I don't know. 
maybe there was jellyfish stings at the beachside and they just, you know, went, went on with it. Um, so there is the difference there. And what would the Lord have a three-hour conversation with you about, do you think? I'm like, I don't know what I'd talk to him for three hours. But it would. what my thinking is, it would either seem like it was no time at all because you had all the questions and you had a great relationship and it was a fantastic catch-up. You know those ones you have that before you know it, five hours has gone by and you're all hungry and you think we missed lunch and you're still talking and you just want to keep talking. For me, I think it would be like that, but it wouldn't have always been like that. And other times it would have been such a long time because I would have felt awkward. I would have felt ill-prepared. I would have felt unworthy. So it's all based on that relationship with Christ. If he's going to have a three-hour conversation with you in a cloud where no one else is involved, what's he going to be talking about? What are you guys going to be talking about together? I know what I'd talk to him about, but I talk to him about like that anyway. So we already have those conversations. So like I would just be in awe and like, oh my gosh, but I'd still be able to get words out, I think. But he would know what I was thinking and it would be a great three-hour conversation. It wouldn't be long enough and I would encourage all of us to have that relationship that a three-hour conversation with Christ would never be enough, that we would want more and that we would plead for him to stay just like the Nephites pleaded for him to stay. Um, rather than having that awkward, like, oh my gosh, you know, I don't want to talk about, yeah. So have a think of that. What would your three-hour conversation with the Lord look like? It's a good question to ask yourself, right? Good one to pose to youth, too, if you're teaching youth. Anyway, all right, hang around. We're going to stay in chapter 2. We're just going to look at some verses on about the three problems that the brother of Joe had and how he solved them and how that can help us. All right, I'll see you there.